Today I'm going to talk about how to avoid overpaying for a stock. Before I do that though, I should say that I'm not offering any specific investment advice, any buy or sell decisions. I think everyone watching this should seek out the uh, help of a qualified conflict of interest free investment advisor because everybody's circumstances are uh, unique to them. The opinions I offer are for entertainment and educational purposes only. Okay, so there's basically six ways that you can look to to figure out whether you're overpaying for a stock or whether a stock you buy is likely to cause you pain at some point in the future. The first of those is return on assets. A low return on assets, anything below 15%, puts you in a kind of danger zone. And I'll, I'll use uh, two examples of companies that are currently trading, although I'll change the names to protect the guilty. Uh, the first company I'm going to name Boring Bob's Shoe Repair. And the other one is going to be Steve Sexy's Global Megacorp. Okay, so Boring Bob's return on assets right now is 29.29%. Steve Sexy's uh, return on assets is 0.8%. Boring Bob's shop, the business retains a little over 29 cents of that dollar. Whereas every dollar that comes into Sexy Steve's business, the business retains a little over 0.8 cents. In general terms, you want high return on assets and you want to avoid those companies that present you low return on assets. All the research says that when you get low return on assets, that's very, very bad. Point number two is the price earnings multiple. Some people critique the price earnings multiple. Earnings is an accounting fiction. Cash flow may be a better measure, but it's price earnings multiple is a, is a good rough and ready layperson's guide to whether a stock is expensive or not expensive. And so generally speaking, you want to pay less for something because the more you pay for something, as I've said many times and will continue to say, the more you pay for something, the lower your subsequent returns are going to be. Boring Bob's uh, uh, price earnings multiple right now is about 14 times. Sexy Steve's is an eye-popping 882 times as of mid-March 2014, which means that in order to buy a dollar of uh, Boring Bob's earnings next year, you'd have to pay a little over $14 a share today in order to buy a dollar of Sexy Steve's earnings, you'd have to pay a little over $880 today. You want to avoid Mr. Sexy uh, because the more you pay for something, the lower your subsequent returns are going to be. Another thing about price earnings multiples is that the overall market reverts to a price earnings multiple around 16 times. Sometimes research comes out that says it's a little bit less than that, sometimes a little bit more than that, but safely about 16 times. Earnings revert upward from below to about 16 times, and they crash downward from above to about 16 times. So in general terms, uh, as a good rough and ready guide, you don't want to pay more than 16 times earnings for any stock. We see so far the combination of a relatively low price with boring bobs at a price earnings multiple of a little over 14 times, and it has a return on assets of about 29 times. Sexy Steve, on the other hand, has a price earnings multiple north of 880 times, and it's got a return on assets of less than 1%. So far, we're seeing a pattern emerge, and those people who are buying Sexy Steve right now might be in a bit of a world of hurt. Another thing you want to look at is whether the company that you're thinking of buying gets a lot of media attention. Getting a lot of media attention, you would think, actually helps the stock, but actually the opposite is true. There's some great research by Lily Fang and Joel Perez that points out that a controlling for every other type of risk Companies that get a lot of attention in the media tend to underperform companies that get virtually no media attention by about 0.2% a month, which equates to a little over 2% a year, which over time is a huge difference. You want to uh, avoid those companies that, special, that, that get a lot of media attention. You want to not buy those companies. And you want to focus on the uh, businesses that are a little on the boring side that have, again, great return on assets at relatively uh, inexpensive prices. Related to the idea that you want to avoid media darlings is that you also want to avoid what are called story stocks. So if people anticipate great things from this company in the future because the story, uh, the company has a great story or a great narrative around it, so they bid up the price of it. And this is something we've seen throughout economic history, whether we're talking about tulips in 1637 or railroad stocks in the mid-19th century, dot-com stocks in the late 1990s. Anytime that a, uh, a company or an uh, asset class has a lot of optimistic momentum behind it, future returns can be pretty terrible. It's a good idea in general to avoid so-called story stocks. Now to look at our examples, Boring Bob doesn't get a lot of media attention at all. 
it's not really a story stock because shoes have been around for a long time. There's no sort of new paradigm shifts uh, in, the sh in the domain of shoe repair, whereas Steve Sexy is an innovator. The innovations that Sexy Steve creates lead people to bid up its price uh, because of this great, bright, optimistic future that, again, is only dimly understood. Now, the fifth thing you want to look at before you invest in a stock is whether the stock is big or not. Uh, at the turn of the century, Michael Mobison, in his great book, More Than You Know, cited some great research from the Corporate Strategy Board that said that once a company reaches revenues of between 20 and $30 billion, the growth of that company starts to stall. Derek Van Beaver and Seth Vary wrote a great book called Stall Points, and they uh, confirmed that idea that once a, you know, once a company reaches a certain size, it's likely to stall. They, they point out that 87% of uh, large companies reach what's called a stall point. When a company reaches a stall point, they've only got a 1 in 15 chance to come out of that stall point. And so most of the time, a company that you know has done really, really well grows to a point, and then it can grow no further. What they found also is the subsequent 10 years, 74% of the company's market capitalization or its value uh, got destroyed. You really, really want to look out for companies that have grown, grown from medium size to large size. At some point, they're going to hit an inflection point or a stall point, and their future can't be as bright as their past. You want to avoid large companies because what happens is investors set up a mismatch between the expected future of the company. They assume that, that the recent past is going to continue into the future at the, same, at the same rate of growth, and that stall point really crushes their expectations, which really devastates the investment. It turns out that both Sexy Steve and Boring Bob aren't of sufficient size to worry about uh, on this scale quite yet. The sixth and final point I want to make is that you want to avoid serial acquirers. And you want to do that for two reasons. First, think about it. When company A buys company B, they have to merge those two cultures, and it's really, really difficult to do that. As Whitney Tilson points out, uh, two-thirds of all acquisitions fail. And if those are the odds of something uh, against you, why would you invest in a company that does a lot of acquiring? Second, and a bit more technically, when acquirers acquire another company, they tend to overpay for it. Let's say the acquired company's assets are worth $100 million. The acquirer, because they get excited about the anticipation of the synergies and whatever other management buzzword is floating around at the time, will pay maybe $130 million for the company. And that $30 million, that excess over and above the value of the tangible assets, I mean, the amount that the acquired company pays uh, over and above the value of the tangible assets is called goodwill. So no, another word for goodwill is vapor. And enough goodwill on a company's balance sheet is uh, bad for shareholder value because it doesn't really represent any form of wealth at all. My, my belief is that you should strongly avoid companies that actively acquire other companies. Their failure rate is so high. And again, to use the examples that we've been uh, going through, Boring Bob has not acquired any businesses in the last 10 years, whereas Mr. Sexy has acquired uh, eight companies in the last four years and has also acquired a battery of patents as well that he paid $4 million for. Again, there's a theme emerging. These six ideas are all sort of interrelated. If a company's got a high return on assets and it's also inexpensively priced, it also sort of wins in those other areas. And if a company is overpriced, it's been bid up by an optimistic story, and uh, it'll also tend to uh, commit cardinal sins in other domains. When companies are big acquirers, our story stocks are in the media a lot, they make low return on assets and they're expensively priced, that's a sign of the kiss of death for an investment. At some point, it's going to go down in price. In closing, the last thing I want to say is that because you see a company that's overpriced and you avoid it, it might be frustrating to you to watch it get bid up and up and further up in price, but that frustration is nothing compared to the pain of actually buying it at that elevated price. It's nothing compared to the pain of watching something you own come crashing back to earth at some point in the future. Even if it is a little frustrating to watch Sexy Steve's price continue to rise on the vapor of the excessive optimism that we see in the stock market in the spring of 2014, it's really, really important that you maintain a discipline of only ever buying things that have a high return on assets, for example, and are inexpensively priced. Okay, before I let you go, I've obviously made up the names Boring Bob and Sexy Steve. Those companies don't actually exist, but I didn't tinker with the numbers. Those numbers actually do exist, which says to me that manic 
investor optimism isn't just a problem from 1637 with tulips or the mid 19th century with railroad stocks, uh, turn of the last century with dot com stocks. This is a problem that exists for people today. Basically, human nature hasn't really changed that much, and we have the capacity to bid up the value of something beyond what is reasonable. Just as Seneca points out, it takes a long time for things to grow, but things rapidly crash back down. And at some point, the people who have overpaid for this optimistic story are going to see a massive sort of crash. And I don't want you to be one of those people. So avoid stories and pay reasonable prices for high return on assets. Thank you very much for watching. Next time, we're going to be talking about uh, the surprising habits of rich people. And then uh, the video after that, I'm doing a piece on Canadian debt. So I hope you stay tuned for those, and I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day.